Pope Leo XIII is a personal favorite of mine. He is credited with the launching of the contemporary work of Catholic social teaching. He laid the groundwork for the Anglican Ordinariate today by, frankly, laying down the law regarding holy orders. He wrote a dozen encyclicals on the power of the Holy Rosary. And on top of those achievements and numerous others, he penned the St. Michael Prayer. He is the longest reigning pope, at least in terms of his age and, and you know how old he was during his entire reign. He is directly tied to the Fatima message, despite his passing more than a decade prior to the events in Fatima, Portugal. So today, in this month's edition of We Were Warned, we will be going over the St. Michael prayer and its ties to Fatima, as well as to what I call the ape of the church and its architect, Teilhard de Chardin. Today is a tale of two apparitions, two supernatural events that shaped the church of our time, one from heaven and one clearly from someplace else. Let's start with who St. Michael is in brief, and then into the vision of Leo XIII. St. Michael is the most powerful of God's angels, the leader of all angels and of the army of God. In the Bible, when Satan declared war on God, it is St. Michael who defeated Satan and expelled him from heaven. He is a powerful protector against spiritual attacks, and as such, when Leo XIII had a vision of Satan threatening the church, he wrote the famous Prayer to St. Michael. Here are some details on this. Note the date. On October 13th, 1884, exactly 33 years to the day before the miracle of the sun in Fatima, Pope Leo XIII had a terrifying vision of the future of the church. With a handful of cardinals and Vatican staff members in attendance, Pope Leo XIII had finished saying the Mass in the Vatican Chapel. He suddenly stopped at the foot of the altar. His face turned ashen white and remained there standing for about ten minutes in a trance-like state. Later, when asked what had happened, the Pope said that as he was about to leave the altar, he heard two voices. One voice was of a kind and gentle nature, while the other voice was guttural and grating. He listened to the voices, which seemed to emanate from the tabernacle, and overheard the following conversation. The voice of Satan in his pride boasted to our Lord, I can destroy your church. The gentle voice of our Lord, You can. Then go ahead and do so. Satan responds, to do so, I need more time and more power. To which our Lord says, How much time? How much power? Satan replies, Seventy-five to one hundred years, and a greater power over those who will give themselves over to my service. Our Lord replies, You have the time. You will have the power. Do with them what you will. After having the vision, Pope Leo XIII immediately went from the Vatican Chapel to his private office and wrote the prayer to St. Michael giving with it the instructions that it be prayed after all low Masses. The practice of reciting this powerful prayer after Mass continued for decades, until it was officially suppressed by the Vatican. We'll go into that in a moment. Removing the obligation to recite this prayer, along with the three Hail Marys, the Hail Holy Queen, and the prayer for the Church, which was the traditional means of ending the low Mass, did not mean it's forbidding its use either publicly or privately. Later, John Paul II would recommend the use of the prayer in private life, but he did not use his authority to return the prayer to its pride of place after the Mass or before Sunday Mass. Something to, to consider there. Now let's note something. This happened on October 13, 1884, 33 years to the day before the miracle of the sun in Fatima, Portugal. Many assume, those who are familiar with the story, that the devil would immediately be granted the power and unleashed. But there is no reason to assume as much. I mean, our Lord said you will have the power. It has been hypothesized by numerous Fatima researchers that Satan was unleashed in the world on October, 30, on October 1917. What was happening at that time? First, we had the rise of the Bolsheviks and their work as agents of chaos during World War I, and the unspeakable wickedness that happened in Russia at their hands, including an unprecedented move against Christianity broadly in that country. That entire ideology would not use brute force to spread itself internationally, though it did do that at times. Over time, its adherents would realize that more subtle approaches that undermine cultures and social orders around the world was a much more effective means of propagating itself, to the point that now, more than a hundred years later, we are witnessing the thrashing of the devil in its final throes. Its a hundred years are almost certainly up, which begs a lot of questions, but before I get into those questions, we now turn to something else, another related story to this one to compare the Leo XIII vision to, something just as influential as a Bolshevik ideology. 
although on a smaller scale, and that is the vision and demonic experience of Teilhard de Chardin. And if you're not familiar with this account, you should be. But first, let's mention in brief who he was, because I sometimes forget that these figures are not known to everyone. Chardin was a French Jesuit priest who was coming of age during World War I. He would serve in the war, go on to do his graduate studies, teach geology, and is regarded today as an influential scientist and priest, noted for his application of evolutionary theory to God. He has been cited by virtually all of the post-conciliar popes as highly influential, despite having been the subject of the pre-conciliar Vatican's ire. He was actually not permitted to be read, officially. Such is the nature of the kinds of appeals that are caused by Vatican II. You know, most of the architects of Vatican II, the so-called fathers of the council, were fans of his. But we get into something here. Think of it as sort of an anti-Fatima. Back in 1919, two years after the Miracle of the Sun, Chardin had this experience with what he called the Thing. Describing this in the third person, Chardin wrote, quote, The Thing swooped down, then suddenly a breath of scorching air passed his forehead, broke through the barrier of his closed eyelids, and penetrated his soul. The man felt he was ceasing to be merely himself. An irresistible rapture took possession of him as though all the sap of all living things— flowing at one and the same moment into the two narrow confines of his heart, was mightily refashioning the enfeebled fibers of his being, and at the same time the anguish of some superhuman peril oppressed him. A confused feeling that the force which had swept down upon him was equivocal, turbid, the combined essence of evil and goodness. You called me here. Here I am, said the thing. Grown weary of abstractions, of attenuations, of the wordiness of social life, you wanted to pitch yourself against reality entire and untamed. And I was waiting for you in order to be made holy. And now I am established on you for life. Or for death. He who has once seen me can never forget me. He must either damn himself with me or save me with himself. End quote. Chardin's words can be found in Father Seraphim Rose's book, Genesis, Creation, and Early Man, if you don't want to help create a market for more of Chardin's books, because you can find it in one of his as well. At the core of his theology, though, is that the nature of God changes to suit our times. You can see how this would influence the spirit of Vatican II. And his theology is actually much worse than that. Um, there was a good interview done by, I'm gonna, it was involving Matt Gaspers. I don't remember where it was, but I might have been on, actually it was on LifeSite News' YouTube channel um, about Chardin. I highly recommend uh, listening to it if you can find it. It's probably from about six months ago now. But go check that out if you can find it. It's He goes into a great detail about Chardin. I would go so far as to say that the spirit of Akin II and the thing that would possess Chardin are one and the same. People typically use the spirit of Vatican II as a means of describing how the council should be interpreted in line with the atmosphere and intentions of the council. But personally, I think there is something much more literal to be had with the spirit of Vatican II. One article I would use for research for this podcast is worth quoting directly on this experience of Chardin's, quote, In light of these revelations, it is not surprising to learn that Teilhard held that even evil spiritual powers are the living instruments of Christ. In the decades that followed this, in his work as a paleontologist and theologian, Teilhard opposed every tenet of traditional Catholic doctrine of creation with a new tenet of a new evolutionary creed. His works became forbidden for the faithful to read, but that, of course, was ignored. He was cited as being heavily influenced to figures at the council, such as Ratzinger and yet yeah, others. So yes, his influence is felt to this day in the church. You will find there are plenty of laymen who read him and cite him as a wonderful figure. I should tell you a lot. In the aftermath of Leo's vision, it is often stated that the 20th century was the devil's century. One could certainly make the case for that. It was indeed filled with the with wickedness of kinds would not seen prior in human history. Two global wars, the satanic spread of Bolshevism, secularism sweeping through nation after nation as Christ's influence was slowly eroded, church attendance collapsing, and along with it, religious vocations dropping dramatically. Impurity and the, uh, shall we say, Moloch procedure spread everywhere, and the church, after the council, barely raised a voice of opposition. One has to be careful when assessing these things because the temptation is to start the devil's century in, in 1884 when in reality it should start during the First World War, at the miracle of the sun, which was a warning from heaven to pray, do penance, make acts of reparation, and to become saints. And I sometimes wonder if the, the sun diving towards the earth is supposed to be symbolic of the presence of the evil one. Think about it for a moment. I could be wrong on that, though. 
The laity were given by Leo XIII and, at Fatima, powerful means of resisting the devil's power. The St. Michael's Prayer after Mass was one such means. Of course, there was the prayers taught at Fatima and the request for the five for Saturdays and, and a, an entire just array of means for which we can do our part as Catholics. But it is interesting to note that even before the Council closed, Paul VI ended the saying of the St. Michael Prayer after Mass in 1964. Much is still unknown, but it was at this time that the ape of the Church of Prophecy, that great mimic of the Church that looks Catholic, but is something else entirely, came to be. The terminology fits, a novus ordo, for a novus ordo seclorum, with the faithful becoming increasingly diabolically disorientated about what the truth is and what our duties are as faithful Catholics. Go look at some of the debates going on about between Catholics right now. The St. Michael Prayer was developed to fend this work off. It was suppressed and replaced by the work of Deschardin and what he called the thing that possessed his thinking, either metaphorically or literally, a literal nouveau theologie that would replace the thinking of the church. If the coming documents on fraternity and the universalism the church wrestles with today are an indicator, this thinking is with us in full force in this pontificate at this time. Yet there is a sign of hope. In the past couple of years, more and more parishes have started having the St. Michael prayer said either before or after the Mass on Sunday. And the growth of the traditional Latin Mass in the Latin Rite includes the St. Michael prayer said after the Low Mass, and it was as it was before the Council. You will see this in many places now. Attendance at these parishes, both of the traditional Latin Mass and the traditionally minded Novus Ordo parishes with the more reverent Masses, are growing, and these prayers are being said by more and more of the faithful especially in these times of universal deceit. It may be that the diabolic disorientation is being lifted, and this devil overplays his hand. After all, his century should be up, and those who have the faith are aware that things have certainly gone wrong. Will the faithful pick up these prayers in greater numbers to resist the devil? But only time will tell on that score, I'm afraid. But let me know what you think of this in the comments. Where do you think the St. Michael prayer falls into the Fatima message, if at all? Am I wrong in saying that pointing out this, uh, the connections? Do you think it's a coincidence? Now, for the record, I don't buy the idea of coincidences when we're talking about heavenly things, but again, you're free to disagree with me. Let me know in the comments what your thoughts on this. And please, regardless of what you think of all this, please pray for the church, now more than ever. Thanks for listening. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.